Yes, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day that wasn't promised. We thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. I ask that you take this word and get it down in everybody's soul that, that we can go out and be disciples for you. We thank you for James leading this. We thank you for everyone that's on the call and everyone that's going to join. I ask that you watch over us and keep your favor and, and your blessed hands over us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Looking in the Hebrews chapter three again tonight. It dawned upon me that majority of us have been in uh, Black Baptist churches. You know, Macedonia used to be called the Baptist Church. I don't know why they changed their name, but apparently Baptists don't believe in speaking in tongues, and we do. <laughs> Nevertheless, praise the Lord. Um, in Hebrews chapter 3, we go down to, I want you to look at verse 14, and it says, we are made partakers of Christ if, conditional statement, we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Okay. That does not sound like eternal salvation, does it? It's not because he's talking to the Hebrew people and the Hebrew people were giving a different gospel than the gospel that goes out today. Today's gospel we preach is the gospel of the grace of God. When Jesus Christ came down here, he preached a different gospel. It's called the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. That gospel of the kingdom is not in effect at this time. In the gospel of the kingdom, you can lose your salvation. When Jesus preached, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Because unless you get this, you'll always be wondering, uh, is the Bible contradicting itself? And the Bible does not contradict itself. It appears contradictory when people do not understand what dispensation is intact. Like today's Hebrew Israelites, they are saying, oh, we black people are Hebrews. So let's do what the Hebrews did in the Bible. They followed Moses. And the book of Hebrews is telling you over and over again that Jesus Christ is superior to Moses, okay? Moses said, God is going to raise up a prophet, calls Jesus a prophet, from among you, who when he is arisen, you are to hear him in all things. Not me, him. Because Moses' gospel is called, what? The law. And if you start going back into the Hebrew Israelite stuff, you must keep the Sabbath. You must, uh, you know, keep the Sabbath. You must not eat swine you must do all these things of the law and legalism that was for the dispensation of those who were under the law that were hebrews and the bible states that because they did not fulfill the old covenant of the law which no one could god did not and does not reverence them or even have respect to them as hebrews as a matter of fact he says he has disinherited them for a time, okay? But what are the new people that just found out? Oh, we're Hebrews. They're running back under the old covenant of the law to do what? To try to please God by the commandments. Why? Because they see in the book of the Revelation, the last book of the Bible, that God says those who keep the commandments of God will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, that is the doctrine of the what? Kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. We born-again believers are not in the dark, the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom was to the Hebrews, not to the world at large. When Jesus Christ came, what did he say? I am not come. When that black Canaanite came and said, heal me, heal my daughter. She is grievously vexed of a devil. What did Jesus Christ tell her? I am not come except to the lost sheep of the house of the world? No, of the house of Israel. And what gospel did he preach? He preached the same gospel that John the Baptist preached. What was that gospel? The gospel of the kingdom. What is the kingdom gospel about? The king is coming. That's what John the Baptist says. The one who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose shoelaces I'm not unworthy to unlace. And John, Jesus said, was the greatest man born of woman. And he said of himself, he was not unworthy to unlace Jesus the Christ, Christ meaning Messiah, shoelace. So where does that leave us who are not 
greater than John the Baptist in a, a bad way. John preached, the kingdom of God is at hand. The king is at hand. Prepare ye the works of the, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his pathway straight. And what did John preach? John preached and baptized a gospel of repentance. What are they repenting from? They were repenting from their evil works, the works of their hands, their idolatry, all the things that the law of Moses forbade. John was preaching, you know, to repent of these things. The king is coming. The king is coming. The king is coming. Jesus Christ, when he got here, what did he start preaching? The king is here. If you don't believe, John 8, 24, that I am he, who's the he? The Messiah, you Israelites will die in your sins. Why didn't he say the, the Gentiles? They were already dead in trespasses and sins. They had no prophet, no priest or king. God chose one people, and that was the Israelites, to make himself known. And they were to be the uh, nation of priests to take the gospel throughout the world and tell them about the Messiah. Okay? They rejected the Messiah, stuck him on a cross, would not believe in his resurrection, and after he had raised there was a great stir among the Israelites about who was this Jesus. He said he was the Messiah. They crucified him. He rose again, and his gospel is being preached. Now we have two gospels. We have the gospel of the law of Moses that is preached every Sabbath. And Paul, after his conversion, what did he do? He went into the synagogues and disputed with them and showing and alleging by the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, Israel's Messiah. The only seminary in the Bible was the school of Tyrannus. It's written of in Acts 19. And Paul had to go into that seminary, which tells you, God's giving you a pattern. Seminaries are not where you get the word of God. You get the word of God from your local church, not from eggheads who think they know it all. You get it from your local pastors. That's where God has put the anointing, okay? He didn't put it in seminaries. It's good to go. But do not think that those are ordained structures of the Bible. The Bible gives you the local church where you are to learn the gospel. Not the gospel of the kingdom, but the gospel of the grace of God. The problem with particularly African-American churches is that we come with an assumption to the Bible. We come when we see the words of Jesus. Oh, the words of Jesus are the greatest words. And they are great words for the dispensation in which he was trying to reach. Jesus Christ's words were not to anyone else except the house of Israel. He tells you that repeatedly. When he told Nicodemus, he said, hey, if I'm telling you earthly things and you're not believing it, and you're a master in Israel, and you don't know what being born again means, then how will you believe when I tell you God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, not just the Jew, Gentile too, whosoever includes everybody, the good and the bad, believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Again, in the gospel of the kingdom, you were not given eternal life, which has no beginning and has no end. It's called Zoe, the life of God. You are giving eternal life, which has a beginning, but has no end. It's a big difference between the gospel of the kingdom that John the Baptist and Jesus Christ preached, which is no longer being preached today, than the gospel of the grace of God. Problem is when African-American pastors and white American pastors, for that matter, come to the scriptures, they look and see the words of Jesus and begin to preach them as if they were the gospel of the grace of God, which was enacted after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there is no resurrection, the Bible says, we are yet in our sins and of all men most miserable. Christ, when a man came to him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Christ did not say, John 3, 16, to believe on me and you'll have eternal life, or he would have been a liar. He would have ceased to be God because his word would have ceased to be true. And him being truth has to be true yesterday, today, and forever. So what did Jesus tell that man who came to him begging how he can inherit 
eternal life. He told him, you must do what? Keep the commandments. What did the man say? I've kept them all my youth. In Christ, the Bible says, looked upon him and loved him and said, the law makes nothing perfect. He didn't say those words, but the law makes nothing perfect. He had kept the law, he thought. And Christ said, but if thou would be perfect, because only things that are perfect can go before the perfect living God. You must sell all your goods, give the proceeds to the poor, and then come follow me. If the man had did that, he still would have went to hell. Why? Because there is no salvation, eternal life in the gospel of the kingdom. That's why Jesus Christ told and foretold that after I leave, you will do greater works than I do. He can only give people everlasting life. We give people eternal life, the exact life of God. In his gospel, he could not, when he preached, he could not have God take up residence inside of that person. Why? Because he had not yet died. The Bible states in the book of Hebrews that way has not been had not yet been made manifest. Therefore, that what that veil had not yet been torn. So we were still being blocked, being blocked. But after his death, blood, and resurrection, what did God the Father do? He tore the veil that was between the holy place and the holy of holies and said, now you can approach the true and the living God on the mercy seat called the throne of grace and have access by the blood of Jesus Christ. When we pray, we say we plead the blood. What we're talking about is we, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we have access to God, the living God. The only person in scripture who uses the term living God is Mark and the Apostle Paul in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. All the rest of the letters, when you find them, even in the book of Hebrews, is written in there three times, the living God. That is a term used by the Apostle Paul, again, signifying that he wrote this letter to the Hebrews because he said of himself that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, of the stock of Benjamin circumcised on the eighth day and he kept all the law except when it came to that last one thou shalt not covet covet means lust and then the old testament it says when your heart lusts for meat so when you say oh, i'd like to have a burger tonight that's you lusting that is a sin again the law was not given to make you holy and acceptable unto god the law according to romans 3 19 was given to what to shut your mouth, to make you without alibi before God and make the whole world guilty before God so that you can be justified by grace. What do we preach? Jesus had to preach the law. Why? Because according to Galatians, he was born of a woman, born under the law. And when the Bible tells you in Hebrews 9, 16, that when a testament is in effect, if you have a last will and a testament, it only goes into effect after the death of the testator. I have a will. My son James and my daughter Mariah cannot come and say, I own this house. I own these properties. I own this land. Why? Because the Bible says in Hebrews 9, 16, that a testament is of no force at all while the testator lives. So when Jesus Christ came, he came full of grace and full of truth. But none of that made a difference because the new covenant had not been established. When did the new when did his last will and testament go into effect, which is called the New Testament? Remember the night that he took bread and break it and the night that he said this is a cup of the blood of my blood of the New Testament, that meant he said, when you drink it, you do show forth my death. Why did he say that? Because it's at the death of the testator that the new covenant goes into effect. And when you give somebody the gospel, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus died again. But when you give a sin sick soul that does not know Christ in the pardoning of their sins, the gospel, what is the gospel? that you're a sinner and I'm a sinner, not because we sin, 
We sin because we inherited the nature of our father, Adam. The Bible says because of one man's transgression, everybody except Christ was made a sinner. Because of how many people's disobedience? One man's disobedience, Romans 5, 19. And by the obedience of how many? Count them, count them. One shall many be made righteous. You're not made righteous because you do righteous things. You're not made righteous because you try to live righteously. All of our righteousnesses are as what? Filth, filthy rags, menstruous cloths that are to be told, get the hints. So we don't stand before God in our righteousness. Paul said that in, in Philippians chapter three, that when I stand before God, not in my own righteousness, which is by the law, which makes me guilty before God, I stand before God in the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. And this is why you got to hear tonight's message. It's going to sound like blah, 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 blah. But if you don't get this, you can end up in hell. A lot of African-American churches are preaching their people in hell. Why? Because when you go to a Baptist church, where do they come from? Where do they preach every Sunday? They come from Matthew. Mark, Luke, and John, which are called the Gospels. What are the Gospels for? Those were the Gospels of the kingdom. Whose kingdom? The kingdom of Israel. Remember after Jesus Christ's resurrection, the apostles came to him and said, tell us, are you going to now restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, uh, that's not in my power to do it this time, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. At that time, the gospel of the kingdom was still in effect. Jesus Christ and God the Father were still waiting on the Israelites to do what? To accept him as their king. They accepted him as their king some almost uh, 50 days prior when he had did what? When he had came into Jerusalem, and they said, Hosanna, king of the Jews, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they wanted to make him king there, and he disappeared. And then seven days later, what were they saying? Crucify him, crucify him. So they rejected their king. Remember when he was born? What did the wise men from the east say? What east were they coming from? They were coming from where da Daniel wrote the scriptures in Babylon. Daniel told the exact year of, the, of when the Christ was going to be born in Bethlehem. When you read the book of Daniel, they had came from the East after having read the scriptures and said, where is he that is born? What? King of the Jews. Okay. In Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom in healing all manner of sicknesses and diseases among the people. Matthew, the book of Matthew, represents Jesus as king. And remember, when, what was the first miracle that Jesus performed? It was at the marriage supper of Cana. Now, you have false Bibles, and for whatever reason, we have a lot of false teachers on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and all other social medias out there that are showing you these are the lot. This is what Jesus did before the Bible. That's not concluded in the Bible. And they got him blinding people and making birds and all this stuff when he was a little kid. The Bible said he did no miracles until he was 30 years old. So those books are a lie. But people have itching ears and they won't come to the Bible that's been in their house from the day they were born. They'll go to these. What does this other book say? What does this other book say? Because they will man love darkness rather than light, and they will not come to the truth. God said, my word is truth. But because they love darkness, they will seek out the words of men. Look at the gospel of Thomas. Look at the gospel of Judas. Look at this gospel over here. There are many, many books not in the Bible. The Bible gives you the type and the shadow. The Bible says, prove all things. The Bible has 66 books in it. How are we to prove that that was what God wanted and no books were left out of the Bible? We have to go back to the Old Testament type. When God said, make the tabernacle after you've seen the pattern I showed you in heaven, Moses. 
And in that tabernacle, when I brought you into the holy place, how many pieces of bread did you see? He said, I saw six stacks. I saw two stacks of six. Six, six. He said, that's what I want you to put on the table of showbread. The bread being the bread of life. When we eat of this bread, we will live forever. It's symbolic of what? The word of God. God's word of truth. So how many how many when how many stacks were there? Two stacks. How many loaves of bread were in each stack? Six, six. It would let you know in type and shadow, there's going to be 66 loaves of the word of God. And when we come to our Bible, the King James Bible, we have 66 books. When we go to the Catholic Bible, they got 70 plus books. Why? And those books that they add, they do not point to Jesus. All scripture, Jesus says, was written about me. The Psalms were written about me. The law was written about me. If you do not see Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, then you do not have proper understanding of what you are looking at. When you see the Israelites crossing out of Egypt and into the promised land, on their way to the promised land, they're going through what? The Red Sea. What is the New Testament Red Sea that we who were dead in trespasses and sins, Egypt being a type of the world, when we pass through this New Testament Red Sea, we're on our way to the promised land. The New Testament Red Sea is the blood of Jesus Christ that delivered us from Egypt, spiritual Egypt. Dead, dead, the dead world, dead trespasses and dead sins. And we are, we're being raised in the newness of life and we're to walk on by faith. When you see all these things in the Old Testament, when you see David coming down to defeat Goliath, Goliath was six cubits tall. His uh, shield weighed 600 cubits. And if he had, if he's like his brothers, his, he has brothers had six fingers, six, six, six. This was David's second time coming to what the valley to meet this person. This is symbolic of who? The seed of David, Jesus Christ, coming down to the valley of Armageddon to defeat who? Satan's emissary, who was what? The Antichrist in the last days. All of these Old Testament stories are showing you what's going to take place in, the, in their fulfillment in the new covenant. In the new covenant. The old covenant is, the Bible said, is vanishing away. Why? Because Jesus Christ nailed it to his cross to take it out of the way for us so that we could do greater works than these. We're already granted in on the ledger of God. When God looks at your ledger, he gives you all the credit as having raised Lazarus from the dead. All the things that Jesus Christ did is put to your account. But Jesus says, but greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. And when he went to the Father, he presented the spirit of his blood up there, which gave you eternal redemption. What is redemption? Ephesians 1, 7 says redemption is the forgiveness of sins through his blood. So what is eternal redemption spoken of in Hebrews 9, 12? It is the eternal forgiveness of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember, when you were born into this world, you were born into this world in the flesh dead and trust passes and sins in the uncircumcision of your flesh. When you believe the gospel, which was the gospel, Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, this work, because faith without works is dead, that God has raised him from the dead, you were saved, and the Bible says that God performed upon you an operation of God called the circumcision made without hands, where he cut off the foreskin of your fleshly nature from your soul so that your soul could be joined into a new man called the divine nature of Christ in you. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What if I sulk? I'll never leave you. What if I get depressed? Well, I'll never leave you. What if I kill myself? I will never leave you. It's called eternal salvation. This is called the gospel of the grace of God. You cannot lose it. Why? Because when you accepted Christ as your savior, he sealed your soul into his body, a sinless environment. Because in Christ is no sin at all. And then he told you 
and I what to do. He did not put our flesh in his body. Our flesh, Romans 7, 25 states, serves the law of sin. And he did not put our spirit in our, he did not put our spirit in his body. He put our soul in his body. That's why he said, cleanse yourselves from filthiness of the flesh and filthiness of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? The fear of the Lord is to depart from iniquity. The reason why we have the world going to hell in a handbasket today is not because of the world's sin. It's not because of the gays. It's not because of this and that. It's because of the church has lost its savor. It's because of the preachers are not preaching against sin. The world told us in the 60s and 70s and 80s, stop telling us about hell. Stop telling us about hell. So we stop telling them about hell. We stop telling them about hell. And when I mentioned hell on our last TikTok, I was told I was given hate speech. You're scaring the kids. And pretty soon, this gospel that we preach to deliver souls from hell will be made illegal. They're already starting it with the, oh, you can't say that. For this community, you can't say that. You're offending people. You're offending. The cross is an offense. The Bible says the preaching of the cross is not only an offense, but it is foolishness to those who perish. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. Again, when Jesus Christ came, he came and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, the opening of the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who were bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord to the Hebrews. He did not come to the Jews, the Gentiles. He did not come to the Greeks. They came to him. And when the Greeks, the Europeans came to him and said, we would see Jesus, what did Jesus do? He went off script of what he was talking about, started talking about his death. Why? Because he was going to die at the hands of the Europeans. Okay? But when the Europeans tell the story, he died at the hands. The Jews are the Christ killers, not us. The Jews are the Christ killers. Because our figurehead, Pontius Pilate, did what? He washed his hands. And that absolved us from all sin. Crazy in your head. The Bible says every man is guilty of guilty of blood guiltiness of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can take that blood on your hand if you apply it to your hearts by believing that Christ's death was for your sins and his suffering. Appease God and God raised him from the dead to make you justified. God's just as satisfied in his sight. Then you'll be saved. But if you die with your hands being guilty of the blood of Christ, you go to hell. And again, hell is the purgatory because you will not be there forever. The Bible says on judgment day, death and hell will cough up its dead and you will stand before the living God, the true and the living God. Do not act like when you live your life, you're living before an idol who doesn't respond to you, who is uh, nonplussed at what you do. God cares about every single thing. The Bible says he tries us every day moment. I want you to look at that. I want you to set eyes on that. If you will, every, turn to the book of Job. Job 7, 18. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? In verse 7, 18, and Job says that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment, every moment of the day, God has got you in a test. The Bible says this is the sore exercise that God is exercising you with. Every problem that comes at you is what? God trying you to see what kind of eternal weight of glory will this soul be worthy of. Those who are lost in trespasses and sins, they try, he's trying them every moment. What kind of eternal hurt and eternal damnation and eternal indignation is this person being worthy of? There will be levels in hell, 
levels of suffering in hell, and there will be as there will be levels of glory in heaven. The Bible says those of you who are wise are leading souls to Jesus Christ. Those of you who are foolish, who is the Christ called the fools and foolish? Those who hear my words, be my witnesses, lead souls unto me, and do not do them. They might be the sweet little old lady that occupies a bench on Sunday, doesn't say nothing to nobody, gives her tithes and offerings, just don't lead anybody to Christ. She's going to go to heaven. But when she stands before God, not on the great before the great white throne, before the judgment seat of Christ, to give account of her service, her stewardship, she shall be ashamed. And you will receive a reward based upon your labor, your labor in prayer your labor in the word of God and doctrine, your labor in, in sufferings and saving souls. The Bible says, pray that you will, God wills that you pray that laborers go into his harvest. To do what? To harvest souls. Because the harvest is plentiful. The fields are white on the harvest, but the laborers are few. You can tell how few the laborers are by how many times in the last 10 years have you been approached by someone trying to witness to you? How many times in the last 10 years have you been approached by someone attempting to share the gospel of the grace of God with you to get you saved? That's how few the laborers are. Because for me, it's been zero, zero, zero. And when I share the gospel with someone and find that they're a believer, my immediate response is, then why wouldn't you try to share the gospel with me? Because they don't serve the living God. They serve their own selves. They're still saved to the uttermost. Christ's righteousness covers them. His Holy Spirit is their holiness before God. And God has given them the perfect perfection of himself through the one offering. The Bible says, by one offering, has he perfected forever those who are sanctified those who believe in Christ. But when they stand before him to see with all that God has done for you, what have you did for him, they will be ashamed. And quite frankly, if they had it to do again, they would do the same thing. Why? Because God, man has no fear of God before his eyes. It would do the same thing. But God tries us every moment. So every situation that comes at you, don't just think, where's God? Where's God? A God brought the test. And when your teacher brings the test, the teacher doesn't write the answer on the board. The teacher has taught you previously how to solve that problem. And you were to do what? Solve the problem with the education that you were furnished. Where's the education to be given? In your local church. Why are people, the majority of God's children, fools? Because the Bible says fools make a mock at sin. <laughs> I'm going to handle my life my own way. Therefore, our children don't go to church. Therefore, parents don't go to church. Our relatives don't go to church. I can have church just at home. What did God tell you to do? In the last days, you should be going all the more, seeing the day is approaching. You can't get any more lazier than Macedonia Baptist Church on a Wednesday night. Macedonia Church on a Wednesday night. Why? We don't even make the attempt to go to church. We got it so easy. We can sit at our homes and watch it on television, save gas, save the environment, save ourselves the trouble, and still half of us don't even attend. Isn't that something? It's letting you know men love darkness. What is darkness? Your way. Jesus says, I am the light. Those that come unto me love the light. Those who want to hear my word, they're hearing what? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Those who do not want to hear my words, want to hear their own thoughts, want to hear their own understanding, want to do it their own way. What did they sing at the Olympics in Paris? After opening the, the Olympics with the mockery of the Lord's Supper with 13 transvestites, okay? The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not what? What's that word? Mocked. And they mocked him before the whole world to show the world we have no God in Paris. 
show the world we don't give this uh, give let's, let's show how irreverent we are to jesus christ so i want you to mark that day remember that day because some god is not going to be mocked by that and he right now he's giving them space to repent he gives you space to repent because the bible says he's slow to anger so right now they lit his fuse it might be 10 years down the line 20 years down the line but when they catch it the whole world's gonna go why did that happen and then god himself the holy spirit himself will bring to their remembrance how they mocked him but the natural man the natural mind retains not the word of god it will reject it oh that could be it and you will testify and tell them you know remember when they mocked god by doing that ah that, that's not gonna happen the Bible says when it comes to the Lord's Supper, for this reason, many are what? Weak and sickly, and some have even died because they don't discern the Lord's body. I belong to a church I was growing up in when I was a kid. The guy was on fire for Christ. is why I'm on fire for Christ today, okay? Name is David L. Gray. Every, he, he, he made, uh, what do you call him? Monster churches, mega churches. Before there were mega churches, he had a mega church in Kansas City, rocking. I would sit on the front row taking notes, loving every word of it, every word of it. Never understood the gospel he's preaching, but I didn't understand the death, blood, and resurrection. I was taught by the gospel of the kingdoms that African Americans preach. And after this man died, his wife went into poverty. The son, nobody stepped in to help his son, and his son started going the way of the world. And then uh, the the mother doing what mothers should do, trying to help the son stay out of jail and this and that. She went into poverty and then she died. And then the church, instead of burying the first lady with the church's finances, that church only gave $2,000. And I said, I'm going to see how God handles this because I know that the pastor that pastored this church was a man of God. And I asked my mother this morning, uh, has uh, Pastor Collier been out to see that? Oh, no, Pastor Collier is so sickly. We had to help him up in the church. Why? For this cause, not discerning the Lord's body, many are weak and sickly, and some have even died. Okay? He's on his way to death. Brain cancer coming back. And it's like, dude, just do the right thing. God loves uprightness. You're not to take people who have devoted their entire lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ and just set them aside as if they've done nothing. Macedonia Church, if you go down there on, almost on any given day, you'll probably see Mrs. Miles there. I don't know if she's on the line of that or not, but she might be seeing her there. And she's there uh, doing her duty, keeping that church up, vacuuming. She's almost 80 years old. The young people should be doing these things. But it's in her heart. She's not doing it for any. She doesn't mention it. She, you just think that, hey, every week we eat there and leave crumbs and table straps and the, the trash full. When we get there the next week, none of that's there. Why? Because she has done that. Now, if they get a preacher and that preacher just disannuls her and doesn't give anything to her, what do you think is going to happen to that? God, God says, do you, don't you think that I will visit for these things? Do you think I'm just going to sit here? I am the living God. The church I went to in Kansas City was called Grace Church of the Living God. God is responsive. He's trying you every moment to see what you will do. What did the Bible say to uh, about the disciples when Jesus says, hey, the people are hungry and they have no bread? And he said this, the scripture states, this he said to the disciples to see what they would do. What do they do? What we all do. Look to their own resources. We only got this much money, but what is that among 5,000 people? He said, cause the people to sit down. We got a kid over here with a, a, a two loaves of bread and five pieces of meat or whatever. Reverse that. Uh, cause the people to sit down. Jesus Christ took what he had and break it. Blessed it gave it to everybody, he said, pick up the scraps, and he had the scraps to feed the 12, his 12 disciples, okay? God is trying us every moment, every situation. When, he's, when you see 
a, a poor relative that has fallen into despair. And don't just sit there and say, huh, they should have saved better when they were young. <laughs> Let me not get in the flesh. Offer help. Offer assistance. And you don't have to come and, I got to do this for you. No, 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 no. That's how people, I don't, I don't, I would not want to receive help from that person as they're trying to chastise you. What you should have did. That's why I got stepped in here. I'm always helping you. No, 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 no. We don't want to have that kind of, we see that on television shows. We saw that on one of the movies. I forgot. I think it was one of the, the lady that won the uh, uh, Black America, First Miss Black America. She was the oldest sister and she was the most prosperous and she had always complained, I got to step in and help my family. You need the, the more, it's more blessed to give than to be on the receiving end. Okay. If God has blessed you to help others, if you see a poor man's child and you decide to close your ears, understand that God is testing you and showing you that, oh, okay, when that happens to you, you're reaping what you sow. When you fall into that situation, how are you going to fall in this? I won't be in that situation. Oh, I'm going to put you there, God will tell you. And he'll put you in that situation. And you'll be able to say, you know, when I was here, I didn't help so-and-so. He'll bring it back to your remembrance. You don't want to be that type of Christian, okay? You can be a Christian that is declaring your faith and going forth in the, in the spirit and the uh, blessedness of the Holy Spirit. Or you can be a carnal Christian and do everything backwards like Jacob did in the Bible. And then at the end of life, what did he say? My years have been 137. They've been days of trouble. They didn't have to be. You had the blessing of Abraham on your life. But what did you try to do? Scheming and stealing and, 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 and tricking and hooking and crooking? You reap that stuff back. Be not deceived. God is not stupid. Whatsoever a man sows that shall he also reap. If you don't like what you're sowing, you don't like what's going on in your life now, then change what you are. Change what you are doing. And guess what? God will change your harvest. But if you keep on in stubbornness, if you keep on in hard heartedness and you keep on in your unrepentant state, when God's spirit says, go over there with us to that person, you go, I feel late. I don't want to. I'm scared. I'm going to know enough scripture. You got all the, the flesh has every excuse under the sun of why it doesn't want to do God's word. Are you going to listen to the voice of the Lord? Or are you going to listen to the voice of your flesh? Fools listen to their own voice. The Bible, the fool's way is right as his own eyes. And God ain't going to say anything. God doesn't say anything to the last day when he judges you. After death, the what? Judgment. People that commit suicide is the most foolish thing they can do. Why? Because they're taking a, a, making a rash decision when they're in a bad emotional state. And then that's when life begins after this life. Okay? If they don't know Christ in the parting of their sins, they go to hell. And then they'll be cast out of hell, judged for their sins, die in their sins, and they will be what? Burned eternally. Why? Why do they got to be burned eternally? Because to get rid of sin, it has to be burnt a burnt offering and your, your sin does not, is not removed except by what? The blood of Jesus. So the sin will continually burn. But since they wanted to be united with their flesh and did not want to believe in Christ, that will separate you from your fleshly human nature. Although your human nature will reside in you and do human nature things, the Bible says you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be the spirit of God dwells in you. Now he tells you to take the word of God and cleanse yourself of filthiness of the flesh and of your spirit. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I uh, don't know if Jackie Mouse is on here again, but not to be preaching about her. But she says, I look at people's spirits. How do you look at people's spirits? You look at it through the word of God. People can come at you with a nasty spirit, a judgmental spirit. People can come up to you with a critical spirit. And all that. Look at people's spirits. You can come at you in the spirit of love. You can just look at people's spirits. Jesus Christ says, do not judge right. Do not judge by the sight of one's eyes. Judge righteous judgment. You judge by the word of God. That's the standard. What spirit are you operating in? Are you operating in the spirit of anger? Are you operating in the spirit of the flesh? Cleanse ourselves from filthiness of these spirits. We got spirit of jealousy. We got a spirit of fear. We got a spirit of power. It's got spirit of love. We got a spirit of... We got all types of spirits. We are to, the Bible says, he that has no rule over his own spirit 
is like a city broken down without walls, ready to be invaded. And Satan, when he sees that, what does he do? He starts shooting fiery darts at you. Let me shoot this arrow at you. Let me shoot this arrow at you. Let me tell you a situation that happened to me at work. I saw an easy little thing to do, and I did it. And apparently, I did it wrong. Put a circuit from here to here. So I got to do. Click it together. And that's it. So these two ladies that work on day shift, and they're Tweedledee and Tweedle Other, decide to criticize me. We had to go back and redo the work you did. Now, if you're going to do the work, do it right. No, no, no. You mislabeled this, and you did this, and you did this, and this, and this, and this, and this wrong. So they, they sent me a letter, each one of them, this week. And I got it when I came back on Monday. Because so I preached ser a sermon Sunday saying, can you take a punch? And I said, you got you to gotta eat. You know you're going to have to eat what you're preaching. So boom, they had a punch from here. Here, had a punch from there. I said, okay. Ah, okay. Well, if I did that, I don't remember doing it that way. But okay, well, I stand corrected. Uh, I, I, I've been rebuked. You cannot grow without what? Rebuke, chastisement, reproof. In Christianity, you're going to get what? Rebuke, chastisement, reproof. Problem is, when you rebuke, chastise, and rebuke, and rebuke people in church, what do they stop doing? Stop coming to church. <laughs> it's not that you stop coming to church. It's God has kicked you out. People say, I'm not going down there because of this, that, that. No. God has hardened your heart. He has kicked you out. And when you're out, guess what? You're getting ready to get some spanking. How does the Bible say you're going to do it? Uh, Second Corinthians, Second, Second, Second Samuel seven fourteen. He uses his sword, which is men. Men will break into your house. Men will steal from you. Men will beat you up. Men will do this. This is God's sword for those who are doing what? Who decided to do it their way? Okay. We are forever in church. Oh, so and so got beat up. Oh, here. Oh, so and so had this happen. Oh, so and so who doesn't go to church had this happen. And so and so who doesn't. What God is with everybody every moment, and He'll use problems in this earth to chastise you to get you back in line. And when they get chastised by men, I'm gonna get that man back, dude. The Bible says you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against spiritual wickedness in high places. And who is in charge of all the spiritual wickedness? Who said, I create good and I create evil? Uh, I think it was the Lord in Isaiah 45. So when something evil comes your way, you need to know who is sponsoring it. Uh, who creates evil? Did it say that Satan created evil? I know your mind. <laughs> That because you don't believe God's word, God's word will spank you. Okay? Who is the said, I create good, I create evil, I, the Lord, do all these things? I want you to look at it for yourself. Create good. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Create evil. Verse 40, uh, 45, verse 7. God says, I, Isaiah 45, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. Men love what? Darkness. God knows what's in the dark. He put it in there. I'm doing this dark thing. Nobody can see me. Uh, he created the darkness. I make peace. I create, what's that word? Evil. I, the, the, so does Satan create evil? No. Satan is just the manager. The manager. Uh, what did God say? Uh, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth. What did Satan say? Ah, skin for skin. You've blessed him with everything. Let me touch him. He'll curse you to your face. God says, all that he has is yours, except save his life. Salvations of Satan, save his life. Those are the words God said. Save, told, told Satan to save Job's life. Okay? So if Job would have got to the point and said, I'm going to kill myself, Satan would have had to jump in there and change things up so he wouldn't kill himself because God commanded him to do what? Save his life. Okay? So you have to understand what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the true and the living God who's very responsive
to everything you got going on. What happened to me at work? Those women were coming at me. And I was going to write a little hot letter. Me and Mike, me and uh, Bobby Miles were talking the other day. I said, man, I'll write emails ready to send them off. And I'll wait about two hours before I send it. So I wrote the little email back. And I had an apologetic email at first. And I got ready to send it. Some said, wait, wait, wait. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. And I went to do my work. And I go to put a circuit in. But there was a circuit in where mine went. So I looked on the label to see where the circuit went to. It went to the one below it. And guess whose names were on that circuit in the wrong place? The lady that did it. And then the lady that, the other lady that certified her work had signed off that it was in the accurate place. So I sent a letter back and said, uh, been very gentle. The Bible says, how do you avoid wrath? A soft answer turns away what? Wrath. So I said, uh, regarding the statements that you said toward me, uh, it verbatim applies to both of you. For tonight, I found when I got ready to do my circuit that you, Patricia, had put your circuit in my place of mine. And you, the other girl, had signed off that it was in the correct place. So the same exact thing you're criticizing me for, uh, you do. So those who live in glass houses should not, and I put dot, dot, dot. I said, now, when I work during the night and I come across your mistakes you make during the day, I do not look up who did it and try to find out who shot John and tell that person. I just correct it and go on. But since you brought this to my, you brought my mistake to my attention, let me let you know that you're making the same mistakes and let me take a picture of it. I took a picture of it and put it on the email and sent it back to them. Generally, for the most part, a lot of women get in their feelings and emotions and <laughs> Quiet as puppies. Quiet as puppies. And that's what you want. You don't want to stir up strife. Why? Because where envying and strife is, there is what? Confusion and every evil work. But know that they're laying for you. Because you rebuke them. They both came at you one way. What did the Bible say? My mother quoted scripture this morning. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against you, you shall utterly condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, whose righteousness is of me. The Bible says your enemies will come at you in one way, and they will flee in seven ways. Okay? So don't expect them to say, oh, we're sorry. You know you're right. No. The Bible says when you correct a servant, he will not answer you. Look at the book of Proverbs. All of your life should be revolved around the word of God. How you respond, your responses. You should not be writing off hot letters and saying how you feel and this and that. That's the filthiness of your flesh and your spirit that you're to have control over again. If I can make you mad, then I can control you. The Bible tells you, he that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city with broken down walls. And when Satan sees a city with broken down walls, he's easy to invade. The first thing Nehemiah did when he was sent back to Jerusalem was begin to build the what? Build the wall, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Let's get back to the doctrine of the kingdom. In the gospel of the kingdom, Jesus Christ said, there were virgins who had 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish. The five wise ones had oil in their lamp. The five foolish ones didn't have enough and asked the five wise ones. And uh, the wise ones said, you could go, need to go get your own. As they left, the king came, took the ones that were ready and the others were left. Now, when we preach that, 
as the gospel, you're preaching the gospel of the kingdom where you can lose your salvation, okay? And you're not to preach that. Let's turn over to Matthew 25 real quick. As when Christ preached, he was telling them, hey, you can lose your salvation because the gospel says the gospel of the, 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 gospel of the grace of God is being preached now. After we're out of here, the gospel of the kingdom resumes being preached to all the world as a witness and then shall the end come. What is the gospel of the kingdom? John the Baptist told him, uh, soldiers, stop doing gratuitous violence, okay? And the tax collectors, stop taking more than what is uh, the, the worthy of the taxation rate, you know? In other words, it's to repent of your evil works. That's the gospel of the kingdom, okay? So when you look at these things, the Bible talks about uh, the guy that had five talents. The Lord came and gave everybody some talents. The one that he gave a talent to that didn't do anything, what happened to him? He, his portion was appointed to the unbelievers. He was called an unprofitable servant in verse 30 of chapter 25 of Matthew. And he was sent into outer darkness where there's weakness, a weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because in the gospel of the kingdom, if you don't repent of your bad ways, you can lose your salvation. The gospel of the kingdom was presented only to the nation of Israel. The gospel of the kingdom was not to the church. We cannot lose our salvation. We have been sealed until the day of redemption, not until the day we depart from the faith or, or faith or really blow it. Okay, We have eternal salvation, eternal redemption, eternal life, guaranteed, saved to the uttermost. These are our new covenant prescriptions but jesus christ when he the words that came out of his mouth were the words of the gospel of the kingdom repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand the king is here if you don't believe that i am he you shall die in your sins and uh let's see here go to the last book of acts acts chapter i think it's 28 Uh, let me see here. Yes, Acts chapter 28, verse 28. When the Jews refused uh, Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Uh, let's see here. <clears throat> let's look, look at verse 27 acts 28 27 for the heart of this people hebrews which this book is written is wax gross and their eyes are their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and i should heal them be it known therefore unto you hebrews that the salvation of God is sent unto the who? Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. So after the gospel of the kingdom was shut down, so they refused to receive Jesus as king, God tells Jesus, uh, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And then after the church age is over, right now, from the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the rapture of the church, we preach the gospel of the grace of God. What is that? Romans 10, 9, and 10. In Philippians, not Philippians, but 1 Corinthians 15. This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, was raised according to our scripture. And if we confess that Jesus is Lord, believe in our hearts that God raised from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation with the heart we believe unto righteousness. We shall be saved. We don't hold out faithful until the end. The Bible says when the gospel of the kingdom is preached, they have to hold on to the end to be saved. If they take the mark of the beast, they'll be lost. Again, big difference between the gospel of the kingdom preached by Jesus Christ and John the Baptist and the gospel of the grace of God revealed by Paul to the church. And that concludes our message for tonight. Any questions? Open up your mic at this time. Oh, we got both Jackies on there. You were here. <laughs> Praise the Lord.
Brother Warden, this is Artie. I don't have a question, but I wanted to ask for prayer for chemist Shirley. Her um, daughter ran over a policeman drunk driving on probation and killed him. Um, and she fled the scene. And then uh, about five years ago, her son got custody of his two boys and was killed in a car wreck a few weeks after that. So that family is really going through in these last five years. Mm. Okay. Kimis is a, a male or female? She's female. Kimis Shirley. Shirley, okay. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask you to intervene in the situation for Kimis Shirley. You say all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. We don't know if she's called according to your purpose, but we know that we are, and we know that this will work together for our good. So we step in as intercessors for chemists and we ask you father to work your ways in her life so that you can bring her salvation peace of mind and the peace of mind to her family we ask you father to look over everyone that is affected by this situation we ask you to comfort those who mourn that uh, lost officer you said that they are ministers of god that are to be for our good if we do well and uh, if we don't do well they're not to bear the sword in vain so this minister of yours that has uh, had his life taken, unfortunately, by a drunk driver uh, by the name of Kim and Shirley, we ask you to look on his family and provide compensatory uh, substantiation to have people come and stand in the gap where he is not there for his children and his wife and whoever else relied upon him. We ask that you, Father, to bring people in there to be a compensatory recompense so that uh, although he is his loss and will never be or, um, uh, the loss will never be forgotten that it won't harm them uh, any further financially uh, emotionally or anything else we ask you to bring people to bring a recompense and to step in to fulfill the ministry that he was sent to do father in her life we ask you to bring her salvation and discipleship so that she can uh, get out of the alcoholism uh, that is a spirit. They call those things spirits. And that spirit was in her spirit. She's probably saved. But she needs to come back to the cross and come back to the faith in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask you, Father, to direct people into her life that are able to lead her and guide her into all that she needs to go into. Father, if she goes into prison, we ask you to protect her there or goes into jail. We ask you to protect her there and put her around safe saints that are there that will protect her and give her provision and give her guidance wherever you may see her. If she's on probation, we ask you to give her guidance and give her deliverance from this uh, alcohol addiction. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Any other prayer requests or additions for tonight? But that's all. I'll end it in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you've given us a gospel better than the gospel of the kingdom, but the gospel of the grace of God. And we thank you, Father, that it was ratified by the death, blood, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we thank you that made, you made us partakers of your holiness and your benefit that cannot be taken from us. Thank you for making us partakers of the divine nature that will never leave us nor forsake us. Father, thank you for giving us, above all, joy, unspeakable and full of glory. We ask you to be with Audrey today when her and her uh, situation with the uh, lawyers uh, cause them to have favor or they have favor and uh, be able to come out with a good outcome with that situation. Father, we ask you to watch over our brother Ron, who is uh, coming out of his addiction and he should be released on this Friday. We ask you, Father, to undergird him with friends and counselors and, and people so that he will not go back into the uh, uh, drug abuse. Father, these things are uh, rife in this nation, and we ask you, Father, for deliverance for him so that he can become a powerful disciple of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to put a heel shield of protection around him. We ask you to bless uh, Sister Shirley, his mother, and bless her for this hip operation she's ready to go into, that it will uh, go be successful, and that she will have strong, be able to walk and not fall. We ask you also to bless uh, Reggie and give him a bendable knee and give him 
uh, healing in his leg in the name of Jesus Christ after this operation so that it will <clears throat> come back to its full strength and he'll be able to walk and not be weary and walk and not faint. Father, all the other blessings that we have and all the other prayer requests that we have that are unspoken, we ask you to go before them. We ask you to bless Artie and her studies to be able to pass this the project manager's test and bless all her nieces and nephews in regards to the situations that they're in and soften the hearts of the brothers and sisters of those who are on this meeting who do not have uh, harmony in those relationships. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Have a good night. Amen. Good night. Good night.